And now, Britain's cathedrals and their music. A programme in the extended weekly series in which we're exploring some of the music of the English cathedral service. Today we visit St Albans, where the cathedral choir is accompanied by the assistant organist, John Freeman, and conducted by the organist and master of the choristers, Peter Herford, who also plays the organ solo. Once again, the scene is set by John Betjeman. It used to be 20 miles by horse down the Watling Street from London to St Albans, a day's ride. This nearness to the capital made the mighty abbey much visited by monarchs and men of influence from Saxon times to the present. Today I've come here by Green Line bus. Through the long and arid building estates with their far-off shopping parades and soaked recreation grounds, through the few surviving stretches of green belt, and then up the straight Roman road to the city set on a hill. The bus put me down in St. Peter's Street. I walked past Marks and Spencer's and all the other chain stores. It was hard to believe that here, on this windy Hertfordshire height, for the first time in Britain, a Christian was martyred for his faith. Britain then was a Roman province and Christ had been crucified only three centuries before. Here Alban, the Roman soldier, the Rose of Martyrs, as he's called, was beheaded in about 300 AD at the time of the persecutions of the Emperor Diocletian. He was brought up the hill to his death from the huge Roman town of Verulamium in the valley below, with its theatres, temples, hot baths, straight streets, and two miles of ramparted walls. Suddenly, beyond the stalls in the marketplace, and above the uneven roofs of the old houses, here in the centre of the town of St Albans, rises that strangely beautiful thing, the low, square Norman tower of the abbey, built on the site of the saint's martyrdom. It's strange, because unlike any other tower of such size and age, it's built of deep red Roman bricks, pillaged by the Normans from the ruins of the Roman city down by the little river Ver at the foot of the hill. The Roman city must have seemed a sinister and haunted place down there in the swamp to the Christians here on the hill. But it was a long time a useful quarry for building material in a county which had little stone except flint and chalk. Saxons, Normans and later ages were always taking bits from it. Out of the roar of the traffic and you go through a hole in the wall into the piece of the abbey yard. You see bits of Roman brick all over the place in the walls of this enormous church. It amazes me how after Henry VIII dissolved the abbey this little country town, as it then was, managed to keep so huge a building intact as its parish church, but it did. And then the abbey was turned into a cathedral in 1877 and was restored by that vigorous, ultra-Protestant, clock-making millionaire, Lord Grimthorpe, at his own expense and in a harsh, convinced manner consonant with his character. The outside, except for the tower, is less impressive than the inside. Come in, as did the pilgrims to St Albans Shrine, by the west door. The first glimpse is terrific, the longest nave in England. Norman, early English and decorated mixed, and mercifully spared the Victorian rage for screen smashing to create views. A delicate medieval stone screen crosses the huge nave. Now we go up steps and beyond the choir to the crossing under that Norman tower. Did you ever see anything so simple and soaring as these huge round arches and some Saxon columns up there in the Triforium? It's like an abbey in Burgundy and it retains most of its original painting. The wall paintings in St Albans are about the best we've got, for the Benedictine monks here in the 13th, 
14th and 15th centuries were famous artists and St Albans Abbey was a sort of college of art. See the crucifixion and angels and kings and saints painted on plaster walls and wooden roofs. Look at the choir screen. It's like that at Winchester Cathedral, high as the church itself. Look at the chantry chapels, cathedrals within cathedrals, with their stone vaulting and iron grills. And now up the steps to the shrine itself, here behind the great choir screen. This place, I think, is the most beautiful part of the church, and many people never see it as they don't venture beyond the choir and up the steps to find it. Part of the original shrine is there. Where St Albans' bones are, no one knows. Possibly one day a miracle will discover them. And beyond the shrine is the Lady Chapel with its richly carved decorated windows. St Albans is three great churches in one. The long nave for the communion on Sundays, the parish communion, the choir for the daily offices, and a lady chapel and other small chapels for weekday and special services. It's also a parish church. The dean is the rector of St Albans and the canons are his assistant priests. And it's a cathedral for Hertfordshire and Bedfordshire. And it's a shrine for pilgrims. Centuries of pilgrimage give it a filled feeling, an atmosphere of use and worship. In June, a sight to see is the procession of people who bring roses to throw on the shrine of St Alban, the Rose of Martyrs. On this winter night, we'll hear the choir sitting in the same place where the monks sat, screened from the pilgrims in their own enclosure of tall Norman walls and lace-like 15th century stone. The cathedral choir is not from London, but from Hertfordshire. Hertfordshire musicians under the present director, Peter Herford, are building up their own rich musical life. And today's programme by the choir is drawn from many traditions. They begin with Cantate Domino by the Italian composer Pittoni, who died in 1743, and O Quam Gloriosum Est Regnum, by the 16th century composer, Victoria, who was born in Spain.
Now two English anthems. First, one for men's voices by Bird, Lord, hear my prayer. And then a verse anthem by Gibbons, Behold, thou hast made my days as it were a span long.
Among organists, St Albans is now famous because of its International Organ Festival. The organ was splendidly rebuilt by Harrisons of Durham in 1960 to a specification by Peter Herford and Rafe Downs. On this instrument, Peter Herford now plays the concerto number no. six in E flat major, which has been attributed, though perhaps wrongly, to Bach.
Finally, Finia Mea Electa, by the French composer Poulenc, who died three years ago, and the Te Diem by Kenneth Leighton, who lectures in music at Edinburgh University.
That recorded programme was broadcast in our weekly series, Britain's Cathedrals and Their Music. It came from St Albans, where the Cathedral Choir was accompanied by the assistant organist John Freeman and conducted by the organist and master of the choristers, Peter Herford, who also played the organ solo. As you will have noticed, considerations of time prevented the inclusion of the piece by Pachelbel, which was advertised. The programme is introduced by John Betjeman, who also introduces next Friday's programme from Liverpool.